in all weathers in the snow and frost of winter in the bitter winds of spring in the hot sunshine of summer in the rains of autumn and again in the snow and frost of winter her husband saw her so she learned from her father it might be once in five or six times it might be twice or thrice running it might be not for a week or a fortnight it was enough that he could and did see her when the chances served and on that possibility she would have waited out the day seven days a week these occupations brought her round to the december month wherein her father walked among the terrors with a steady head on a lightly snowing afternoon she arrived at the usual corner it was a day of some wild rejoicing and a festival she had seen the houses as she came along decorated with little pikes and with little red caps stuck upon them also with tricolored ribbons also liberty equality fraternity or death the miserable shop of the wood sawyer was so small that its whole surface furnished very indifferent space for this legend he had got somebody to scrawl it up for him however who had squeezed death in with most inappropriate difficulty on his house top he displayed pike and cap as a good citizen must and in a window he had stationed his saw inscribed as his little saint guillotine for the great sharp his shop was shut and he was not there which was a relief to lucy and left her quite alone but he was not far off for presently she heard a troubled movement and a shouting coming along which filled her with fear a moment afterwards and a throng of people came pouring round the corner by the prison wall in the midst of whom was the wood sawyer hand in hand with the vengeance there could not be fewer than five hundred people and they were dancing like five thousand demons there was no other music than their own singing they danced to the popular revolution song keeping a ferocious time that was like a gashing of teeth in unison men and women danced together women danced together men danced together as hazard had brought them together at first they were a mere storm of coarse red caps and coarse woolen rags but as they filled the place and stopped to dance about lucy some ghastly apparition they advanced retreated struck at one another's hands clutched at one another's heads spun round alone caught one another and spun round in pairs until many of while those were down the rest linked hand in hand and all spun round together then the ring broke and in separate rings of two and four they turned and turned until they all stopped at one suddenly they stopped again paused struck out the time afresh formed into lines the width of the public way and with their heads low down and their hands high up swooped no fight could have been half so terrible as this dance it was so emphatically a fallen sport of something once innocent delivered over to all devilry a healthy pastum changed into a means of angering the blood bewildering the sense such grace as was visible in it made it the uglier showing how warped and perverted all things good by nature were become the maidenly bosom bared to this the pretty almost child's head thus distracted the delicate foot mincing in this slope of blood and dirt were types of the disjointed time this was the carmignol as it passed leaving lucy frightened and bewildered in the doorway of the wood sawyer's house the feathery snow fell as quietly and lay as white and soft as if it had never been oh my father for he stood before her when she lifted up the eyes she had momentarily darkened with her hand such a cruel bad sight i know my dear i know i have seen it many times don't be frightened not one of them would harm you i am not frightened for myself my father but when i think of my husband and the mercies of these people we will set him above their mercies very soon i left him climbing to the window and i came to tell you there is no one here to see you may kiss your hand towards that highest shelving roof i do so father and i send him my soul with it you cannot see him my poor dear no father said Lu madame defarge i salute you citizeness from the doctor i salute you citizen this in passing nothing more madame defarge gone 
like a shadow over the white road. Give me your arm, my love. Pass from here with an air of cheerfulness and courage, for his sake. That was well done. They had left the spot. It shall not be in vain. Charles is summoned for tomorrow. For tomorrow, there is no time to lose. I am well prepared, but there are precautions to be taken that could not be taken until he was actually summoned before the tribunal. He has not received a notice yet, but I know that he will presently be summoned for tomorrow and removed to the conciergery. I have timely information. You are not afraid. She could scarcely answer. I trust in you. Do so implicitly. Your suspense is nearly ended, my darling. He shall be restored to you within a few hours. I have encompassed him with every protection. I must see Lorry. He stopped. There was a heavy lumbering of wheels within hearing. They both knew too well what it meant. One, two, three, three tumbrils faring away with their dread loads over the hushing snow. I must see Lorry, the doctor repeated, turning her another way. The staunch old gentleman was still in his trust. Had never left it. He and his books were in frequent requisition as to property confiscated and made national. What he could save for the owners, he saved. No better man living to hold fast by what Telson's had in keeping, and to hold his peace. A murky red and yellow sky, and a rising mist from the sea, denoted the approach of darkness. It was almost dark when they arrived at the bank. The stately residence of Monsignor was altogether blighted and deserted. Above a heap of dust and ashes in the court ran the letters, National Property, Republic One and Indivisible, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity, or Death, who could that be with Mr. Lorry, the owner of the riding coat upon the chair, who must not be seen, from whom newly arrived, did he come out, agitated and surprised, to take his favorite, triumph the dread tribunal of five judges, public prosecutor, and determined jury, set every day. Their lists went forth every evening, and were read out by the gullers of the various prisons to their prisoners. The standard guller joke was, come out and listen to the evening paper, you inside there, Charles Evermond, called Darnay, so at last began the evening paper at La Force. When a name was called, its owner stepped apart into a spot reserved for those who were announced as being thus fatally recorded. Charles Evermond, called Darnay, had reason to know the usage. He had seen hundreds pass away so. His bloated guller, who wore spectacles to read with, glanced over them to assure himself that he had taken his place, and went through the list, making a similar short pause at each name. There were twenty-three names, but only twenty were responded to for one of the prisoners so summoned had died in Gaul and been forgotten, and two had already been guillotined and forgotten. The list was read in the vaulted chamber where Darnay had seen the associated prisoners on the night of his arrival. Every one of those had perished in the massacre. Every human creature he had since cared for and parted with had died on the scaffold. There were hurried words of farewell and kindness, but the parting was soon over. It was the incident of every day, and the society of La Force were engaged in the preparation of some games of forfeits and a little concert for that evening. They crowded to the grates and shed tears there, but twenty places in the projected entertainments had to be refilled, and the time was at best short to the lock-up hour, when the, the prisoners were far from insensible or unfeeling. Their ways arose out of the condition of the time. Similarly, though with a subtle difference, a species of fervor or intoxication, known, without doubt, to have led some persons to brave the guillotine unnecessarily. In seasons of pestilence, some of us will have a secret attraction to the disease, a terrible passing inclination to die of it. And all of us have like wonders hidden in our breasts, only needing circumstances to evoke them. The passage to the conciergery was short and dark, the night in its vermin-haunted cells was long and cold. Next day, 
fifteen prisoners were put to the bar before Charles Darnay's name was called. All the fifteen were condemned, and the trials of the whole occupied an hour and a half. Charles Evermond, called Darnay, was at length arraigned. His judges sat upon the bench in feathered hats. But the rough red cap and tricolored cockade was the head-dress otherwise prevailing. Looking at the jury and the turbulent audience, he might have thought that the usual order of things was reversed, and that the felons were trying the honest men. The lowest, cruelest, and worst populace of a city never without its quantity of low, cruel, and bad were the directing spirits of the scene. Noisily commenting, of the men, the greater part were armed in various ways. Of the women, some wore knives, some daggers, some ate and drank as they looked on, many knitted. Among these last was one, with a spare piece of knitting under her arm as she worked. She was in a front row, by the side of a man whom he had never seen since his arrival at the barrier, but whom he directly remembered as Defarge. He noticed that she once or twice whispered in his ear, and that she seemed to be his wife. But what he most noticed in the two figures was that although they were posted as close to him, they seemed to be waiting for something with a dog determination, and they looked at the jury, but at nothing else. Under the president sat Dr. Manette, in his usual quiet dress. As well as the prisoner could see, he and Mr., Lorry were the only men there unconnected with the tribunal who wore their usual clothes and had not assumed the coarse garb of the Carmagnol. Charles Evermond, called Darnay, was accused by the public prosecutor as an emigrant whose life was forfeit to the Republic under the decree which banished all emigrants on pain of it was nothing that the decree bore date since his return to France. There he was, and there was the decree. He had been taken in France, and his head was demanded. Take off his head, cried the audience. An enemy to the Republic, the President rang his bell to silence those cries, and asked the prisoner whether it was not true that he had lived many years in England. Undoubtedly it was. Was he not an emigrant then? What did he call himself? Not an emigrant, he hoped, within the sense and spirit of the law. Why not? the President desired to know, because he had voluntarily relinquished a title that was distastful to him, and a station that was distastful to him, and had left his country. He submitted before the word em What proof had he of this? He handed in the names of two witnesses, Theophile Gabel and Alexander Manette. But he had married in England, the President reminded him. True, but not an English woman. A citizeness of France, yes, by birth. Her name and family, Lucy Manette, only daughter of Dr. Manette, the good physician who sits there. This answer had a happy effect upon the audience. Cries in exultation of the well-known good physician rent the hall. So capriciously were the people moved that tears immediately rolled down several ferocious countenances which had been glaring at the prisoner a moment before, as if with impatience to pluck him out. On these few steps of his dangerous way, Charles Darnay had set his foot according to Dr. Manette's reiterated instructions. The same cautious counsel directed every step that lay before him, and had prepared every inch of his road. The President asked why had he returned to France when he did, and not sooner. He had not returned sooner. He replied, simply because he had no means of living in France, he had returned when he did, on the pressing and written entreaty of a French citizen, who represented that his life was endangered by his absence. He had come back to save a citizen's life, and to bear his testimony, at whatever personal hazard to the truth, was that criminal in the eyes of the Republic. The populace cried enthusiastically, No, and the President rang his bell to quiet them, which it did not, for they continued to cry no, until they left off of their own will. The president required the name of that citizen. The accused explained that the citizen was his first witness. He also referred with confidence to the citizen's letter, which had been taken from him at the barrier, 
but which he did not doubt would be found among the papers then before the president. The doctor had taken care that it should be there, had assured him that it would be there, and at this stage of the proceedings it was produced and read. Citizen Gabble was called to confirm it and did so. Citizen Gabble hinted, with infinite delicacy and politeness, that in the pressure of business imposed on the tribunal by the multitude of enemies of the Republic with which it had to deal, he had been... Dr. Manette was next questioned. His high personal popularity and the clearness of his answers made a great impression, but, as he proceeded, as he showed that the accused was his first friend on his... At last, when he appealed by name to Monsieur Lorry, an English gentleman then and there present, who, like himself, had been a witness on that English trial and could corroborate his account. At every vote, the jurymen voted aloud and individually. The populace set up a shout of applause. All the voices were in the prisoner's favor, and the president declared him free. Then began one of those extraordinary scenes with which the populace sometimes gratified their fickleness, or their better impulses towards generosity and mercy, or which no man can decide now to which of these motives such extraordinary scenes were referable. It is probable to a blending of all the three, with the second predominating. No sooner was the acquittal pronounced than tears were shed as freely as blood at another time, and such fraternal embraces were bestowed upon the prisoner by as many of both sexes as could rush at his removal to make way for other accused persons who were to be tried rescued him from these caresses for the moment. Five were to be tried together, next as enemies of the Republic, forasmuch as they had not assisted it by word or deed. So quick was the tribunal to compensate itself and the nation for a chance lost, that these five came down to him before he left the place, condemned to die within twenty-four hours. The first of them told him so, with the customary prison sign of death a raised finger, and they all added in words, Long live the Republic, the five had had, it is true. On his coming out, the concourse made at him anew, weeping, embracing, and shouting, all by turns and all together, until the very tide of the river on the bank of which the men, they put him into a great chair they had among them, and which they had taken either out of the court itself, or one of its rooms or passages. Over the chair they had thrown a red flag, and to the back of it they had bound a pike with a red cap on its top. In this car of triumph, not even the doctor's entreaties could prevent his being carried to his home on men's shoulders, with a confused sea of red caps heaving about him, and in wild dream-like procession, embracing whom they met and pointing him out, they carried him on reddening the snowy streets with the prevailing Republican calour, in winding and tramping through them, as they had reddened them below the snow with a deeper dye, they carried him thus into the courtyard of her father had gone on before, to prepare her, and when her husband stood upon his feet, she dropped insensible in his arms, as he held her to his heart and turned her beautiful head between his face and the brawling crowd, so that his tears and her lips might come together unseen, a few of the people fell to dancing. Instantly, all the rest fell to dancing, and the courtyard overflowed with the carmagnol. Then, they elevated into the vacant chair a young woman, from the crowd to be carried as the goddess of liberty, and then swelling and overflowing out into the adjacent streets, and along the river, after grasping the doctor's hand, as he stood victorious and proud before him. After grasping the hand of Mr. Lorry, who came panting and breathless from his struggle against the water-spout of the Carmignol, after kissing little Lucy, who was lifted up to clasp her arms round his neck, Lucy, my own, I am safe. O oh, dearest Charles, let me thank God for this on my knees as I have prayed to him. They all reverently bowed their heads and hearts. When she was again in his arms, he said to her, And now speak to your father, dearest. No other man in all this France could have done what he has done for me. She laid her head upon her father's breast, as she had laid his poor head on her own breast, long. He was happy in the return he had made her. He was recompensed for his suffering. 
He was proud of his strength. You must not be weak, my darling, he remonstrated. Don't tremble so. I have saved him. Chapter Vian. A knock at the door I have saved him. It was not another of the dreams in which he had often come back. He was really here, and yet his wife trembled, and a vague but heavy fear was upon her. All the air round was so thick and dark, the people were so passionately revengeful and fitful, the innocent were so constantly put to death on vague suspicion and black malice. It, the shadows of the wintry afternoon were beginning to fall, and even now the dreadful carts were rolling through the streets. Her mind pursued them, looking for him among the condemned, and then she clung closer to his real presence and trembled more. Her father, cheering her, showed a compassionate superiority to this woman's weakness, which was wonderful to see. No garret, no shoemaking, no one hundred and five, North Tower. Now, he had accomplished the task he had set himself. His promise was redeemed. He had saved. Let them all lean upon him. Their housekeeping was of a very frugal kind, not only because that was the safest way of life, involving the least offense to the people, but because they were not rich, and Charles, partly on this account, and partly to avoid a domestic spy, they kept no servant. The citizen and citizeness who acted as porters at the courtyard gate rendered them Laurie had become their daily retainer, and had his bed there every night. It was an ordinance of the Republic one and indivisible of liberty, equality, fraternity, or death, that on the door or doorpost of every house, the name of every inmate must Mr. Jerry Cruncher's name, therefore, duly embellished the doorpost down below. And, as the afternoon shadows deepened, the owner of that name himself appeared, from in the universal fear and distrust that darkened the time, all the usual harmless ways of life were changed. In the doctor's little household, as in very many others, the articles of daily consumption that were wanted were purchased every evening in small quantities and at various small shops. To avoid attracting notice, and to give as little occasion as possible for talk and envy, was the general desire. For some months past, Miss Pross and Mr. Cruncher had discharged the office of purveyors, the former carrying the money, the latter the basket. Every afternoon, at about the time when the public lamps were lighted, they fared forth on this duty, and made and brought home such purchases as were needful. Although Miss Pross, through her long association with a French family, might have known as much of their language as of her own, if she had had a mind, she had no mind in that direction. Cruncher did. So her manner of marketing was to plump a noun substantive at the head of a shopkeeper without any introduction in the nature of an article, and if it happened not to be the name of the thing she wanted, to look, she always made a bargain for it by holding up as a statement of its just price, one finger less than the merchant held up, whatever his number might be. Now, Mr. Cruncher, said Miss Pross, whose eyes were red with felicity. If you are ready, I... Jerry hoarsely professed himself at Miss Pross's service. He had worn all his rust off long ago, but nothing would file his spiky head down. There's all manner of things wanted, said Miss Pross, and we shall have a precious time of it. We want wine, among the rest. Nice toasts these redheads will be drinking, wherever we buy it. It will be much the same to your knowledge. Miss, I should think, retorted Jerry, whether they drink your health or the... Mr. Mr. Cruncher, with some diffidence, explained himself as meaning old Nick's. Hey, said Miss Pross, it doesn't need an interpreter to explain the meaning of these creatures. They have but one and it's midnight murder and mischief. Hush, dear, pray, pray, be cautious, cried Lucy. Yes, yes, yes. 
I'll be cautious, said Miss Pross, but I may say among ourselves that I do hope there will be no oniony and tobacco-y smothering. Now, Lady Bird, never you stir from that fire till I come back. Take care of the dear husband you have recovered, and don't move your pretty head from his shoulder as you have it now. For gracious sake, don't talk about liberty. We have quite enough of that, said Miss Pross. Hush, dear, again, Lucy remonstrated. Well, my sweet, said Miss Pross, nodding her head emphatically. The short and the long of it is that I am a subject of his most gracious majesty, King George the Third. Cruncher, in an access of loyalty, growlingly repeated the words after Miss Pross, like somebody at church. I am glad you have so much of the Englishman in you, though I wish you had never taken that cold in your voice, said Miss Pross, approvingly. But the question, Dr. Manette, is there it was the good creature's way to effect to make light of anything that was a great anxiety with them all, and to come at it in this chance manner, is there any prospect yet of our... It would be dangerous for Charles yet. Hi, ho, hum, said Miss Pross, cheerfully repressing a sigh as she glanced at her darling's golden hair in the light of the fire. Then we must hold up our heads and fight low, as my brother Solomon used to say. Now, Mr. Cruncher, don't you move, Lady Bird. They went out, leaving Lucy and her husband, her father, and the child, by a bright fire. Mr. Laurie was expected back presently from the banking house. Miss Pross had lighted the lamp, but had put it aside in a corner, that they might enjoy the firelight undisturbed. Little Lucy sat by her grandfather with her hands clasped through his arm, and he, in a tone not rising much above a whisper, began to tell her a story of a great and power. All was subdued and quiet, and Lucy was more at ease than she had been. What is that? She cried, all at once. My dear, said her father, stopping in his story and laying his hand on hers, command yourself. What a disordered state you are in, the least thing, nothing startles you, you, your father's daughter. I thought my father, said Lucy, excusing herself, with a pale, Oh, father, father, what can this be, Hyde Charles? Save him, my child, said the doctor, rising and laying his hand upon her shoulder. I have saved him. What weakness is this, my dear, let me go to the door. He took the lamp in his hand, crossed the two intervening outer rooms, and opened it. A rude clattering of feet over the floor, and four rough men in red caps, armed with sabres and pistols, entered the room. The citizen Evermond, called Darnay, said the first. Who seeks him? Answered Darnay. I seek him. We seek him. I know you, Evermond. I saw you before the tribunal today. You are again the prisoner of the Republic. The four surrounded him, where he stood with his wife and child clinging to him. Tell me how and why am I again a prisoner? It is enough that you return straight to the conciergerie and will know tomorrow. You are summoned for tomorrow. Dr. Manette, whom this visitation had so turned into stone that he stood with the lamp in his hand, as if he were a statue made to hold it. Do you know me, yes? I know you, citizen doctor. We all know you, citizen doctor, said the other three. He looked abstractedly from one to another, and said, in a lower voice after a pause, Will you answer his question to me then? How does this happen? Citizen doctor, this citizen, pointing out the second who had entered, is from St. Antoine. The citizen here indicated nodded his head, and added, He is accused by St. Antoine. Citizen doctor, said the first, with his former reluctance, ask no more. If the Republic demands sacrifices from you, without doubt you as a good patriot will be happy to make them. The Republic goes before all. The people is supreme. Evermond, we are pressed. One word, 
the doctor entreated. Will you tell me who denounced him? It is against rule, answered the first. But you can ask him of Saint and Toyn here. The doctor turned his eyes upon that man, 